Good morning and welcome to worship for Sunday the 11th of October. We've now had a couple of trial runs in preparation for the first in-person service for the congregation, which will take place a week on Tuesday, Tuesday the 20th at 11am. There are only 20 seats available at that service and bookings are essential using the guidance provided in the most recent newsletter. After a break over the summer, the Guild and the Thursday Club will be having their next af virtual afternoon tea this coming Thursday, the 15th at 2pm. The whole idea of this is that you stay at home and you enjoy a cuppa, and maybe even a bit of cake, and you take time to phone someone or write a letter or a card just to let someone know that you are thinking of them. If you can join in, then please do, so that we can all take a bit of time to remember one another. And finally, each year we designate October as our stewardship season. And we take time to think together about our giving of time, of talents and of money. This is not so easy to achieve this year, but I would want to take a moment this morning to acknowledge those who have really gone the extra mile in giving of their time and talents to enable the reopening of the church for worship and those who have worked hard throughout the past six months to keep the life of our congregation going. I'd also like to thank everyone who has continued to make their offering for the life of and work of Christ Church in this place. It would be fair to say that our income has taken a significant downturn and so we would encourage you to continue your offerings and if you can, consider whether this is the time to review your giving. If you need assistance with your offering, then please help me, uh, phone me and I shall do my best to help you and point you in the right direction. We are a church family, living and working to serve God. To equip us to do that, God invites us to worship him. Let's do that now, united though separate.
God said, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and give you hope. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, we live in strange times with a sense of constant flux. From day to day we are uncertain how much freedom we will have to do what we want and to see who we want. It can be so hard to see the way ahead. Remind us as we gather that even when we don't understand everything, you have always guided your people and provided a way ahead. When we feel overwhelmed by the circumstances of our time, teach us that you sent your Son to walk with your people in difficult times and places. You have a clear purpose for each of our lives and you understand us in our good days and bad. As we worship you now, help us to set aside our anxieties and place our trust in you. We make our prayers in Jesus' name and pray together the words he has given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Our reader today is Maureen Brooch. The reading is from Philippians chapter 3, reading from verse 14. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, become like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward, in Christ Jesus. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. It was time for the quarterly muster of the contents of the officer's mess bar, and a volunteer was sought. A very keen young officer volunteered for the task and off he went. He met the chief steward who had laid out all the contents of the bar on the top and left him to it. When he finished, he handed over the reckoning to the chief steward who was dismayed to discover that what he thought he had didn't tally with the officer's accounting. 
the officer was asked to count again. And when he came to exactly the same totals again, double the stock that the chief steward thought he had, the mess president was summoned. The three men debated for a time, trying to figure out why there was such a discrepancy. And then the president asked the officer to take them through the count step by step. And as they did so, it became clear what the problem was. The officer had counted every single thing on the bar and then its reflection in the mirror behind the bar. A number of people over the years have dined out on that story. The young officer in question has gone down in many people's memories for the good things he achieved. Not for the good things he achieved, but for that one major error. That's a bit like what Paul is saying in the section of his letter to the church at Philippi that we've heard this morning. Paul's credentials are impeccable. He has every right to tell Jews that Christianity was to be commended because he was first and foremost a Jew and he'd been a faithful and an effective one. But in his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, he discovered that all the things he felt could be written up as credits in his attempts to gain acceptance from God actually counted for very little. Striving to be like God and to please him by countless acts paled into insignificance when he met the risen one whom he encouraged others to crucify. Paul says, everything that you think might be counted in my favour amounts to very little. In fact, he was saying it's a bit like the reflections that young officer counted. It appeared to be significant, but it didn't amount to anything. In the scheme of things. What Paul meant was that what truly counted was what he did with his life from the point that he met Jesus. For it was in that meeting that he discovered that pleasing God isn't about doing things but about having faith in him and trusting. That's hard for us isn't it? When we were young, we were taught that believing in God was all important. But somehow the message we received changed so that we believed the most important thing was to be a good person. That was what God wanted, we were told. So we strived to be good. And in time, that has led to many claiming you can be a good Christian without actually confessing a faith in God. Christ as the crucified and risen Lord. In our nation over the past few decades, many have come to believe you are a good Christian just because you do good things. You can't. You can be a really good person by doing good and kind things. But to be a Christian, your goodness and kindness must flow from your faith in Christ as Lord. Now that does not diminish the value of what's done by so many people without faith. It simply gives it a context. Paul acknowledged that before he became a follower of Christ, he did spend his life trying to please God. But when he met Jesus, he discovered that following wasn't about doing it was about being. There's a difference between believing in Jesus as a good man we want to emulate and accepting him as saviour who doesn't ask us to prove that we are imitating him well enough or following the rules carefully enough. It sounds as though becoming a follower is very complicated, doesn't it? But it isn't. It's actually much simpler than the alternative in truth. What Christ asks of us is not is that we look to him not as a model for action, but as the one who's prepared the way for us. And what we need to do is follow through his life and on into the next. 
After all, Jesus has already walked here and awaits us beyond the grave. Paul finishes up by saying that he's still on the journey. He's still aiming for what Christians are promised. He's still a work in progress, and so are we. Christ says to us, still follow me. And he's serious. He's not asking to see your qualifications. He's not asking you to account for the past. He's asking you to offer him your here and now and your future so that he can be yours too. Let us pray. Lord, we take a moment this morning to give you thanks for the past, for the people who've influenced us, the lessons we've learnt, the circumstances that have shaped us, the opportunities presented. We believe in you as one who has plans for us, and these plans began long before we were able to confirm them, conform to them or reject them. So thank you, Lord, for the plan for our individual lives. Allow us, as we pause in silence now, to reflect on how those plans have been worked through. As we count our blessings, so we become conscious too of times we didn't ask, act in godly ways, when we failed, made mistakes, hurt others, hurt ourselves, hurt you. Sometimes, Lord, it's ha hard to let these things go when we recall them. Teach us that you already know we're not perfect, but that we are forgiven not by merit of our own, but simply by your grace and love. Resting in that knowledge, may we begin afresh today, seeking not to please you by our actions, but purely by living as you've commanded, simply graciously, lovingly, with our faith at the heart. We pray this day for those whose lives have gone awry, perhaps people we know, maybe family members, perhaps remote characters we've heard of on the news, or folk we've never even heard of. Transforming God, you're already present in their lives, but you can only shape them when you allow them to do so. So soften their hearts and give them a fresh understanding of you. Change them that they may face the days before them, better equipped and sustained by the knowledge of your love. We pray this day for those who, for whom faith is a struggle or maybe even a battle. Calm those wrestling with the big questions which have left a trail of doubt across their lives. Comfort those whose hearts are so heavy that faith seems beyond reach. 
give peace to those who feel they cannot cope with the challenges that life presents them. We commend ourselves and every part of our living to our loving Heavenly Father. Amen. has a plan for you. May you be open to that fact and discover its truth. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with you now and always. Amen. Make me a channel of your peace Where there is hatred, let me bring your love Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord And where there's doubt, true faith in you O oh, Master, grant that I may never seek So much to be consoled as to console understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace, where there's despair in life let me bring hope, where there is darkness sadness ever joy. Oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to 
be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, in giving to all men that we receive. Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul.